Welcome back. I hope you have had a good uh, coffee break. So this morning we had a fantastic talk of Stefan and we learned about a real application, a machine learning in, in, in real industrial application. So, and we also learned about reduced order modeling, control theory, and so on. So what is missing um, is what do we do if we want to control a complex, nonlinear, high dimensional system like turbulence, and we have, say, 10 actuators, 10 sensors, and uh, what should be our strategies for optimizing a control goal? And this is what I will talk about today, and I will use my usual path. So first, I will come from human understanding, so model-based control, and then I will go to completely self-learning control. And we will learn from the wisdom of the eagle, which Steve has uh, already introduced. So essentially, we will try to imitate a bit the uh, nature's way of um, learning. And the, uh, um, this is based on collaborative work with Guy, sitting over there, uh, with Nang, Luke, Francois, Van uh, uh, de Wey, uh, Yuzhou, and again, Marek, Steve, and uh, Ulrika. So first, I will introduce you to the applications of turbulence control. Then I will demonstrate you in one example benefits of feedback control. I will show you in the next example how far you can go with model-based control. Uh, high lift configuration with a two-frequency dynamic. And then we will go learn a new method, machine learning control. Uh, which conquers a nonlinear jungle and we apply to distributed actuation in a turbulent jet and a couple of other things. And for those of you uh, who do not have experiments but CFD, uh, I will offer a poor man's version, cluster-based control with a corresponding example. Uh, my lecture will end with a summary and with a quick demonstration of our machine learning control uh, package, which you can download from the web page. Motivation. So we have seen already some nice motivation this morning. Another motivation is a car control strategies for drag reduction. So if you want to reduce the drag for lowering the fuel consumption and so on, uh, the first choice which you would take is aerodynamic design. So here you see a car, a concept car of Renault, um, obviously very aerodynamically designed. Where can you see that? What is aerodynamic about the car? Yes, good. What else? Well, look at the wheels. It has very small gaps. So this is one thing. Look at the bottom. It has a diffuser. So the wake is uh, re reduced. And now the question is, what could we do more on this car to reduce the drag even further? Well, we can build some actuators at the trailing edge over there. Is, is there a pointer? Any pointer? Okay. So we could uh, make some actuation here at this uh, trailing edge. Uh, or we could blow or we could suck. Or we could uh, do a uh, multi-frequency uh, forcing here. We can do it blindly. Uh, but of course, the best is if we in, uh, include the flow state. So if we do some closed loop control. So this is where we have the largest opportunities. And actually, a lot of these things have been done. If you go to a magazine, called Research and Development in 2004. You see this car, and you see here the, um, some um, sim simulation with, with an experiment with, with an um, um, actuation off. So the wake has a certain shape. So now the, you have zero net mass flux blowing uh, here. Uh, um, there's a change in the, in the, in the wake um, structures. What is most important, you gain something like 20% drag reduction at 90 kilometers per hour. Uh, this translates to about one liter of fuel savings on, on, on 100 uh, um, um, kilometer. And they claim it only took 10 watts of actu actuation energy. Sounds very good. But then we should see it at the cars, right? If it's that good. Any idea why we don't see it on, on, on the cars? 
Well, the answer is so the solution is too expensive. So they figured out it would cost uh, the customer something like 3,000 euros, uh, uh, and, and uh, none of the customers would, would invest this uh, for these um, savings. Now there are, uh, there are uh, a myriad of other applications. You have seen these examples already in Steve's talk. Uh, you can go from simple um, academic configurations to more practical ones, trains, cars, wind turbines, uh, engines, and so on. So there are myriad of possibility of doing turbulence control and doing uh, closed loop control. The, uh, at the end, you will always have uh, um, a dynamical system, so your plant. You want to reduce the cost, for instance, um, um, the direct, you have some pertur perturbations into the physical system, so this is called real-world uh, conditions, and you never know the full flow state, you only have some sensors, and you have to use the sensor knowledge to build a controller, and the controller drives the actuators, and there are several possibilities now, you can do open-loop forcing, very famous is uh, periodic forcing, this is uh, very frequently um, used, you can do closed-loop uh, um, control, uh, um, with, with, with um, sensor feedback, or you can do a combination um, of both. And you have seen this slide already, so I will give you more uh, um, reasons to get inspired by, by this path, by the machine learning path. I want to show today that you can actually do the control optimization in the plant where you would not be able uh, to do it uh, with, 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 with a, with a model-based paradigm. So, Stefan, I'm sorry, I explained it already in my, 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 my first talk. So now we uh, um, benefits of um, closed-loop control. Uh, um, in my first lecture, we have discussed uh, the wake stabilization with a um, hot wire sensor here and a volume force um, here and the controller was derived by some, um, by some model, so uh, by some three-dimensional model. Uh, and if you want to stabilize a flow, of course, you need feedback. You cannot stabilize a flow without feedback. Now the question is, isn't this a bit academic? What do you do in the experiment? Well, here we have an experiment. D-shaped body, flow is from left to uh, right. Uh, um, the goal is to reduce the drag. Uh, you have a couple of 15 pressure um, um, gauges. You can uh, blow and um, um, suck on both actuators independently. The Reynolds number is around 40,000, uh, so it's reasonably um, turbulent. And I'm reporting now about a PhD thesis which has been done some time ago by um, uh, Marc Pastor. So the question is, how do we design the control from the sensor readings to the, to, the, to, the, to the actuation? If you don't actuate, we find von Kármán vortex shedding. This is a smoke visualization um, here. Here you see a vortex, and a vortex, these structures should not surprise you. Uh, if you have a vortex, a vortex uh, um, is a low pressure region, so the fluid particles spiral around. And in order to, uh, to compensate for the centripetal force, you need a lower pressure inside. So if the vortex is close to the body, low pressure, and, and you get an extra jack. So one control strategy is uh, uh, to prevent the vortex shedding here and, and, and delay it. Now the question is, how can you possibly um, um, do this? One thing is, if you look at the um, vortex here, it's uh, um, anti-symmetric, so the U prime in this direction corresponds to the, U pr the opposite U prime here. So maybe you should do symmetric forcing. And obviously the flow likes the uh, harmonic frequency, so you should just do something else. So you can, could take, for instance, golden section times the natural frequency uh, uh, to be ma maximally um, incommensurate. And it turns out this is a pretty good choice. Of course, you, you learn it in hindsight. Uh, so if you actuate with a frequency which is slightly lower than the natural frequency, then the flow um, um, stabilizes, and you get 40% increase in the base pressure, 20% decrease in the drag. So now you could say, I'm very happy with this open loop forcing. Uh, where is the problem? Well, suppose, for instance, uh, you would change the velocity um, a bit. Suppose, for instance, you would now decrease the velocity, suddenly your actuation frequency, your physical actuation frequency becomes your natural frequency, and the drag increases again. Uh, 
So uh, you have no robustness against change of uh, your oncoming velocity. And so this is one of the reasons why we may want to use feedback. In the next step, uh, step, we do feedback control, phase control, something which is similar to what Scott uh, was, was um, teaching. And now we get the same drag reduction, but now for all Reynolds numbers. So we can change the Reynolds numbers and we still get uh, this 20% drag reduction and we also save on the actuation energy, 40% actuation energy. So now, now with every watt which we invest in the actuation energy, we g uh, gain 5 watts in the um, towing power. So this is energy, very energy efficient. By the way, you can also stabilize the wake with high frequency forcing, but then your energy investment would be uh, um, significantly uh, um, um, larger. Now there is one application where uh, where you cannot do anything with open loop control. Suppose, for instance, one of the actuators fails. You can only actuate on the lower side. So in this case, I can tell you, um, open loop control will not work, and you need to do some type of closed loop control. You get the same drag reduction, the same energy, and again, this is not doable open loop. So this is a motivation why uh, uh, um, feedback uh, may be, um, uh, how feedback is beneficial for, for instance, uh, a wake stabilization. So you came here also for some math, some equations, how can you treat these things uh, on, a, on a more physics-based uh, uh, um, way? Well, you would typically start with a velocity field uh, um, corresponding to the steady solution, and then you have a fluctuation. The fluctuation is harmonic. That means it can be spent by something like a cosine mode and a sine mode, so essentially two-dimensional approximations should be reasonably good enough. So we have seen now enough example um, of this case. Uh, the linear dynamic looks something like this. Uh, um, so these mode amplitudes behave like a uh, um, 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 growing um, um, oscillator and you can actuate and we can change, uh, um, ro rotate the mode in such a way that we uh, um, only affect the second oscillator. So this is single input uh, um, control here. Now, how uh, can we um, simplify things? We can now write uh, things in polar coordinate and look at the growth rate, the natural growth rate uh, uh, corresponding with the nin linear dynamics and you will quickly figure out this corresponds to that. And what does the uh, uh, um, actuation do? The actuation is an extra term. So this one uh, um, is an um, instability, so this one will always lead to the growth. So now you have to design your actuation in such a way uh, uh, that this is negative. How can it be negative? Very easy. If A2 is positive, then B must be negative. If A2 is negative, then B must be po uh, positive, and so on. So essentially, uh, um, this, uh, the, the si sign of B should be opposite to, to A2. Uh, what we want, we want to stabilize the dynamics, so we want to make sure that it uh, um, decays exponentially fast. So essentially what we want, our controlled dynamics, controlled stabilized dynamics corresponds to this dynamics here. And now we would like to get a controller for this purpose. So a naive choice is the following. You take this equation here and in it invert it uh, and, and solve it for B. Where's the problem? You divide by A2 and suddenly you get infinite control. Obviously, this is not a good choice. But you can um, go on, a, on a, uh, do something simpler. You can make the ansatz B equals, uh, you make a linear ansatz uh, uh, with um, opposite sign. And now you can determine the gain such that the equation is satisfied in a one period averaged sense. And then you arrive at such a controller. Uh, you see here, if, if the more you want to stabilize, the larger the gain. The more unstable the flow, the larger the gain. The more effective uh, the physical gain of the um, um, actuator, uh, uh, um, the, the, the smaller the gain. So this controller makes perfect sense. What I'm showing you here um, is called energy-based control. And the advantage is I, I, I've teach, taught you this now in three minutes. So you don't need to go through the control theory textbooks. This is one advantage. So it's a very simple approach. Uh, there's another advantage, namely, uh, since it's an energy-based approach, it also works for nonlinear settings. So we have used it for all. Uh, most of our um, approaches. 
So this is linear full state uh, um, um, feedback. Here you see an example. So we choose some parameter, growth rate 0 0.1, frequency 1, gain equals 1. So the story is always like this. If, if, if a coefficient is not necessary, set it to 0. If it's supposed to be small, set it to 0 0.1. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so g equals 1. And if we want a controlled growth rate, which is opposite to the natural uh, growth rate, then it, this implies that the gain should be 0 0.4. I could explain why, but I will not do so in, in the moment. Um, the, in, the, in, the, in the dashed line, you see how things spiral outward. And at some point, control kicks in, and now we spiral inward again. Control designed uh, um, and finished. And you see it's a bit elliptic. Uh, uh, why, why is it um, el el elliptic? Because essentially you can only act in this direction. So it, when you are here, you have a strong gain. So you can significantly reduce the amplitude. If you are here, you can do nothing because your control uh, has to be um, zero. So now we have a perfect understanding of uh, um, linear control and uh, a very simple method of doing so. Why is this of relevance for turbulence? Um, well, it's, so this is linear control theory. We have heard the exquisite talk of uh, um, um, Scott. So there are a number of nice things you can do in addition, which energy-based control does not deliver. So opt you can guarantee optimality of the control, guarantee robustness. You can do state of, of the estimation from sensors, sensor-based control, and so on. So lots of nice things. Why is this uh, 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 in my lecture about turbulence control? Well, you have oscillatory coherent structures. You can have a dynamical model, a calibrated dynamical model, for those. And at the end, you will always arrive at some phasor control for the dynamical system. So your control will always be the measured phase minus a difference and then cosine and then so, so, some gain. And uh, you could also use empirical uh, identification of the phasor going at the end, end. You only have two parameters in, 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 your, in your control law. Uh, to some extent, you don't need the model. <laughs> so the model comes as an ornament uh, uh, to your uh, publication or to your um, understanding, however you see it. We have also talked about uh, nonlinearity. So there is one nonlinearity uh, uh, with associated with uh, Reynolds stress. Uh, the, the average flow does not stay as a steady solution. You move away. So we have seen it in in, in my first talk, now you decompose the velocity field in the steady solution, in the first harmonics, and in the uh, mean field deformation. Again, first harmonics, mean field deformation, you get such a dynamical systems, uh, which we have discussed um, earlier. So there is an oscillation where the growth rate is determined by, by A3. So A3 is the shift mode, it's the base flow variation, and this is proportional to the Reynolds stress. And and, and, and so effectively, you have a locally linear dynamics which you can control. It will not surprise you that the control design works. Let's look at one uh, um, solution. Uh, um, you, there's a periodic solution to this system, which is shown here. Uh, in, in weekly nonlinear stability theory, you say the growth rate is proportional to the Reynolds to the Reynolds number difference to the critical Reynolds number. So the further you go away from the critical Reynolds number, the larger the growth rate. Uh, um, and at the end, you arrive at the Landau equations, which we did already in our first lecture. So you get a linear growth rate, a cubic a damping term. And uh, in, 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 in this setting, um, the growth rate is proportional to Reynolds number minus Reynolds crit, assuming a supercritical Hopf bifurcation, which you observe for the um, cylinder wake. So typically, you can relax this. So this is not really necessary. You can identify also a model even at high Reynolds numbers. I just mentioned it for completeness because uh, uh, there are a number of publications who uh, um, do similar approximations uh, um, from a stability perspective. So how can we design the control? 
very easy. We do the energy-based control, then we get something like this. We get practically the same controller, except that the growth rate now uh, um, is the natural growth rate minus the mean field uh, bifurcation. So this ar arises if we take the local linear uh, uh, um, model. So this is a justification of the linear parameter varying uh, um, control. And essentially what this equation says, if you are in the limit cycle, then this growth rate should be zero. So that means your actuation should be lower. But if you want to go um, closer to, to the steady solution, then your gain must uh, um, increase. Now there is a sweet spot. At some point you have stabilized the flow and then also this A2. Uh, um, um, goes to zero. So initially you, you have to ramp up your control and, and then you have to uh, decrease uh, your, your control to, um, to zero after, after stabilization. So this is the situation again. So now uh, um, A1, A2, we live on the mean field paraboloid, which we have seen already now a number of times. You spiral outwards. Uh, at the end, you end up on a limit cycle. And then we do our control. You see the, the, the red curve here. And then we move downwards back to the limit cycle. If you want, you can try these type of things. So control design is easy. Modeling is also, also easy. Again, why am I teaching it? Well, there are oscillatory coherent structures. The base flow modulation on the mean field have been frequently experimentally observed and what we found in our collaborative research center for flow control. If you don't take into account the base flow variation, uh, and then your uh, control may not work. So this is a critical enabler for control and which is also increasingly realized in JFM and publications. And we also can identify the mean field paraboloid from experimental data from turbulent flows where you would not initially um, expect them. Good. Now we go to another configuration uh, closer to what um, Stefan was, was teaching, high lift configuration. Um, so this is a old fashioned design, uh, three uh, slats. We uh, want to increase the lift. For this, we can do blowing and suction here at, 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 at this point. Uh, our plant is a, a MK Epsilon uh, a model, and, um, and we do a, a 2D unsteady run, stru structured grid, and so on. The purpose of this exercise is to explain why high frequency forcing mitigates or increases the lift and also reduces the drag. So this is reduced order modeling for understanding, which at a later time we also use for control. If you look at the unforced flow, uh, uh, you see these type of, of streamlines here. So there are some vortices. If you average, one vortex here persists. Of course, this is not good. And um, if you look now at the fluctuation, you see heavy vortex shedding here. This is not good. So I've flown w once in a, in, in, in a uh, Lockheed 1011, and when it was landing, high lift configuration, you know, I, I could really feel the vibration. So this must have happened um, um, there. If you do some periodic forcing with a frequency which is 80% uh, um, um, larger, then uh, you, you get a much more streamlined configuration. So you, in the average, this is just a small uh, fluctuation. And so the fluctuation which remains is high frequency shear layers um, 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 structures, which you see here. So here, this gives rise to a 15% lift increase, and we would like to have a dynamical uh, uh, model explaining this. We have now two states. So there's one limit cycle corresponding to natural shedding, which we can resolve with the POD modes uh, uh, without actuation. There's another limit cycle with the actuated flows. So these are two other POD modes which we use. The total fluctuation now has four POD modes, which you see here. And the base flow somehow has to respond to the strengths here and the strengths um, here. And as I will explain in a second, each of these Reynolds stresses from this fluctuation and this fluctuation changes the base flow. So we get two additional uh, um, shift modes or two additional modes describing um, the base flow variation. So here you can have a forced transient from this limit cycle here or natural transient back. And uh, this uh, shall be described as such a dynamical system. Uh, and the fluctuation drives the base flow. So we derive the 
uh, um, and base flow effectively from the Reynolds equation. And um, the actuation is modeled essentially by, by uh, um, the blowing and the suction here and the derivative. The reason is the following. We want to have a cosine and sine signal and we never know to which phase uh, um, our actuation communicates. So this is a model at which we arrive with some mean field consideration. I ask you to believe it for a moment. So this is what you arrive if you do harmonic balances. Uh, if you look at the first, uh, if, if you look at the harmonics, contribution of the harmonics of the natural shedding and actuated shedding, what you see here, a dynamical system with two oscillators, one oscillator here, one oscillator here, and the actuation on this side, and uh, it, the actuation only affects the shear layer structures. And... Um, Without forcing, this growth rate is positive, so vortex shedding will always want to occur. The uh, shear layer vortices are always negative, so without forcing you would not see them. So you have a damped oscillator here, which you need to excite, and you have a, a forced oscillator, uh, um, an unstable um, oscillator here, which you cannot directly affect, but somehow they seem to be communicating. How are they communicating? If you look at the growth rates here, you find that the growth rate of the unstable uh, fluctuation has uh, a, a positive value here. Then there is a component which gives rise to the cubic damping. So the up, without actuation, this growth rate will go to zero by this amplitude increasing. Uh, um, and, but if you, if you actuate strong enough, you also mitigate the growth rate. So if this term is as large as the growth rate, then this growth rate becomes zero and uh, um, von Karman vortex shedding cannot um, exist. Of course, there are other, the frequency depends on both energy levels, the other growth rates and so on. But this is the key equation which you need to keep in mind. And what this equation tells you, it tells you, you excite one frequency, it changes the base flow. And by changing the base flow, it mitigates the linear system uh, of the um, um, vortex shedding. This is an example of frequency for crosstalk, which you would miss with any linearized um, approach. Any questions so far? So, this is a model. Of course, now I have to show you that the model is not only a fantasy. Uh, what we do, we fit our model to the U runs that are here, A1, A2 from vortex shedding, A3, A4 uh, uh, from the um, shear layer structures. And we see here two transients. So there's one transient going from the limit cycle to the fixed point, and then one from the fixed point to the limit cycle. So one is a forced transient, and the other one is a natural transient. And here you have the opposite uh, um, scenario. You start at the fixed point, then you go on the limit cycle under actuation. If you stop actuation, you go inwards. And this is what our model does. And con considering the com uh, simplicity of our model, this is already pretty um, um, impressive. Uh, um, reproduction. There's one parameter which is extremely important. How does uh, A3, so one of the modes, correlate with uh, the, the actuation? So if you get the phase relationships wrong, of course, your, your, your uh, uh, model will have to be poor. The dashed line corresponds to the model and, and the solid line here uh, uh, corresponds uh, to the original run starter. Now we look at the lift and when we turn uh, this is the lift coefficient over the time, we turn the actuation on and the lift increases. Uh, we see already the high frequency signature here. Uh, then we stop actuation and then it goes down and then we see the fluctuation of von Karman vortex shedding. If we fit the lift coefficient with uh, um, some uh, um, expansion, we get a pr reasonably good um, um, reproduction. The dashed lines are what the model predicts and the solid lines are what the uh, uh, runs uh, predict. 